Hello and welcome to another episode of PPC Town Hall. My name is Fred Valles. I'm your host. I'm also the co-founder and CEO at Optimizer. So for today's episode, we have a uh, first time guest, uh, which is always exciting because a lot of people have come back on the show many times, but we have a first timer and um, the person is going to talk to us about feed management. And so uh, we're right here in the middle of Q4. We're weeks away from Black Friday, biggest time of the year for retailers. So hopefully everyone's got their feeds ready, but uh, let's hear a few tips for the last minute optimizations and things you can still do with your structured data. Uh, I think it's also super relevant in today's day and age where we're looking at constraints on shipping, manufacturing. So uh, what's in your feed today, what you actually have for sale today it may not be what you have for sale even a week from now. Um, you might unexpectedly get that container to arrive and now you have this stuff that you didn't think you would have. So what do you do at the last minute to get your campaigns ready? We also have a returning guest who's going to talk to us a lot about marketplaces and retail media. And so what's the other side of PPC here? We tend to focus a lot on the Googles, the Microsofts, the Amazons, but there's a lot more stuff out there in terms of marketplaces and uh, ways that you can advertise your products and basically get more sales. So I'm really excited for this uh, episode. So uh, let's get rolling with uh, PPC Town Hall. All right, so uh, how to turn those products into profitable PPC campaigns. That's the topic of the day. Welcome, everyone. We have our two guests on right now. Uh, but before we talk to them, I'd like to remind everyone that we're uh, doing this on a live stream. Um, and Joey, welcome. Glad to have you on from the beginning. Uh, and hey, I don't even have to say people already know what to do. Tell us where you're calling in from. So that's awesome. Jacques, um, our new guest, first timer, where are you coming in from today? Uh, I'm based out of uh, Amsterdam in the Netherlands, Europe. Very pumped Jacques from Optimizer is here. <laughs> wait, wait, I think, Joey, you're confusing things here. Uh, this is Optimizer. Uh, that's Data Feed Watch. Yeah. <laughs> so we're both CEOs of our companies, but we both work in the optimization space. So, uh, so yeah, Jacques, welcome from the Netherlands. Thank you very much. Elizabeth, uh, thanks for returning to the show. Where are you calling from today? Seattle, Washington. So West Coast. West Coast. Yeah, Good at the morning. start of this call, uh, I was making two coffees for this show and Jacques was complaining that I didn't make him one. And I'm like, hey, Jacques, it's five o'clock somewhere. I mean, grab a glass of wine or something. Elizabeth and I will do the coffee here. But uh, are you having coffee? At tea this morning, actually. Normally. Um, well, I kicked uh, caffeine at the beginning of the year. Although I did have to have it because I was able to get back on the road to a conference um, two weeks ago. I went to Italy to speak at AdWorld Experience. So let's talk about that maybe first. So, Elizabeth, I know you do the circuit quite a bit, right? Uh, have yeah. you been anywhere? Are you going anywhere? So everything's been virtual. My first in-person is scheduled for the much-delayed HeroCon 2020, 2022 mm -hmm. now. Yeah, right? <laughs> Um, hopefully in person in Austin, Texas. I, of course, have my reservations about all of the things all the time, but I did travel recently for work a couple of weeks ago and it was pretty seamless. So I have, I have high hopes to see mm -hmm. folks in person and choose the wristband of my color, whether that's a red, yellow, or green in terms of like high, f if we're doing elbow bumps or fist bumps or high fives or whatever. Um, I'll, I'll, it's a, I think it's an in the moment choice. Um, Fred, you're going to be a keynote, right? Yes. Uh, I'm opening it. And I'm very excited to be after like two years of not seeing anyone, just uh, have a little party. I mean, it'll be so good to be back together. And so do much we, has changed. Do we like for every 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 speaker that opens their session with some comment about like how long it's been since they've seen people or like, uh, you know, that we're in person or anything like that, the pandemic, like you have to do a shot or something? Yeah, or or so. will the event be over by like 11? Well, yeah, exactly. Then it would be over by 11, right? Um, and, and that's the luxury of doing the opening keynote. Like, I'll say that. And then every other speaker is like, oh, shit, he stole my thunder on that one. <laughs> um, that's, yeah. that's a very good point. You should run with that. And I'm thinking of ways to make this fun, right? It's like, this is not just another conference. And so much has changed in, uh, in Google and advertising. So we'll definitely talk about that. I feel like you have um, to come up with like a killer icebreaker, like with everyone just saying it kind of like turn to their partner for, or somebody at their table for like 10 seconds, like take it out of the keynote and just be like, 
just some really great question. And like something that it's, it's not like, what was you, you know, what was the, the thing that you bought yourself during the pandemic or like, you know, where do you work? Some, something, something really interesting. Like what was your most guilty pleasure, like binge show during the whole time? And, and it can't, and the answer can't be Tiger King because we've moved on. So like, oh my God, is that during the pandemic? That was so it long was ago. technically. So here's the question. What is the plastic surgery you most want to do after seeing your own face on Zoom for two years? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah. Uh, okay. it's a good one. I'll take I'll take the fifth. I'm gonna though. save it. I need it in January. I need that answer in January. Jacques, what were you gonna say? I said it's a good question, but I'll take the fifth. You'll take <laughs> That's acceptable. All right, so uh yeah, we got lots to talk about here today. So um oh my god. Uh Leon wants to get rid of his whole head, unfortunately. That is very sorry. Gonna need it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you will need your head. Um, okay, but so let's jump into the topics here. So uh, Jacques, you you uh, were one of these other great people who basically reached out and said, hey, um, I've got something to talk about. I want to come on to PPC Town Hall. So we love when that happens. Um, but you run Data Feed Watch. So tell us a bit about what you do and, and what's new in feed management. Okay, yeah, I'm running Data Feed Watch. Uh, so we uh, we help uh, 15,000 online shops in, uh, in in like 50, 60 countries to uh, to create data feeds for any channel that they want to be on. So you know, there's primarily Google, a lot of Facebook, a lot of custom channels, a lot of Amazon, obviously. But you know, we have like more than 2,000 channels. Uh, uh, we have an integration with like more than 2,000 channels, uh, and that shows you know the, the width of the interest of the retailer. That uh, you know, Google, Facebook, and Amazon are uh, the big guys, uh, but there's so many other channels where a retailer can still make a profit. Uh, actually, I think that that's one of the, trend, the trends that we've seen. That even though the big three are getting big, bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, we see the emergence of all kinds of niches. You know, from uh, you know, retargeting affiliate networks, you know, aren't, which aren't really new, uh, but are interesting alternatives, different ways to uh, to tap into a, a new revenue stream. But also very niche sites like, uh, you know, we just recently closed a deal with Pix, which is a, a marketplace for wine. So only wine sellers go there. Uh, we think we have like, I think, three different uh, comparison shopping engines in our system just for guns and ammo. So this is very specialized. And so, you know, if you uh, if you are selling Smith & Wesson or, you know, a very good wine, I'm sure you'll still want to be on Google, uh, you know, or maybe even on Facebook and Amazon. But that's where you'd go uh, as well. You know, and, and, and our job is to help the retailer create those awesome data feeds because uh, the feed is a foundation on, on of every campaign, regardless whether it is uh, big Google, big Facebook, or a small uh, gun website. Hmm. Very interesting. Elizabeth, talk about the proliferation of marketplaces a bit. Uh, um, you work, and then tell us a little bit about what you mostly focus on because I think <laughs> people don't really know the shift that you've made. And so then... I've made like, I don't know, four career shifts probably in the last 15 years. So started as a classic paid search, you know, Google, I remember Google Analytics version 1.8, you know, I still have my Yahoo advertising search ambassador certificate somewhere. Um, but most recently, uh, I am now in retail media. So I'm working with Walmart, Target, Instacart, Kroger, uh, you name it. And so Jacques, to your point about proliferation, the answer is yes, um, so much. And so um, on average in this last year, I've probably spoken to about 22 different retailers. And of course, everything with that is you know, contingent on availability of the product, but also the product information. So as these retailers start to move more of their catalog online, that information being correct and everything, but also within those retailers, they're expanding and making their own marketplaces. So just yesterday, CNN re released a story about the um, partnership between Kroger and Bed Bath & Beyond. So Kroger is now going to carry Bed Bath & Beyond's private label items on their site, which also has a third party marketplace powered by a, a platform called Miracle. And Bed Bath & Beyond later also no noticed in the CNN article that they will also be starting a third-party marketplace on their website. So it goes so so much further beyond Amazon, beyond eBay, uh, and then you know it's it's en the di digital endless shelf, right? So that's what I do now. I call it job security. 
there's the digital shelf, and then I went into a Bevmo. Um, so for those outside of the U.S., it's a uh, it's a liquor store, basically wine store. And at the entrance of the store, they were like, "You can get your soap uh, delivered in like less than an hour now." And I was like, oh, "That's sort of weird that they're running ads." But then I go into the store, and like half the store has been converted into like a convenience store. Yep. And so they're using this physical retail space and rearranging it to basically, well, I can buy my soap there. But the real point is that the most likely items that you want to get delivered, these local um, or very hyper local stores. Funny thing, Bevmo was acquired last year by GoPuff. GoPuff is a micro fulfillment centers, get it to you in 20 to 30 minutes um, app, essentially. So it's out of Philadelphia. Forget what their valuation is. Um, I think it's like 10 billion with a B. They bought Bevmo and Liquor Barn, and then they have another um, outlet in the um, the EU. And I can't remember who they bought recently, but it's all about micro fulfillment and being able to get it to you in that last mile, so within 20 minutes. Yeah. And alcohol has so many restrictions. So Jacques, to your point about the wine category, um, yeah, Jacques uh, bring, is bring up the right? <laughs> like guns and and wine. And uh, hey, Jacques, should we throw in weed as well and a couple of other things? Uh, no, that would be a bit too corny from a, for, from a guy from Amsterdam. But, uh, you know, <laughs> we also have, like, channels that are specialized in, in kids' clothing or in, like, vintage clothing or stuff like that. Uh, so, yeah, it goes beyond the, 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 the wheat and the wine. Yeah, but so, it's so uh, important, those attributes, right? Those are very different attributes between the two. <laughs> exactly. And that was going to be my question. So to what degree... Um, are retailers and marketplaces just adopting the Google Merchant Center feed standard, uh, kind of like what Microsoft did? And to what degree do you have to think about new attributes? Um, and to what degree do you, like what are the most important elements to optimize in the feed? Uh, well, I, I, I did see an increase in a number of large channels that uh, that have adopted the uh, the Google feed, you know, like Facebook, like Criteo. Uh, you know, the, the, there's several of them, uh, but still, uh, the, the the vast majority is still hanging on to their own uh, to their own feed system. And I think that even if the feed requirements and the feed structure would be the same, you know, of your channel as as Google channel, uh, then still. Uh, for a retailer, it's important to have separate feeds because, you know, on one channel, you do other stuff than on the other channel. Uh, you may have... So we talk about stuff like the headlines that they show might be different, the titles they show, the length might be different, or what's, what are kind of the key differences? Uh, yeah, no, actually, well, you know, if you're on a niche site, you may, you may, you may even consider uh, putting on different images than on the more gen general search uh, uh, environment like, like Google. Uh, title is the uh, the biggest differentiator, uh, I would say. Uh, title, I think, is first. You know, first of all, it's the most important field uh, in in your feed, whether that's Google or or Wine or whatever. Uh, uh, you may want to differentiate that uh, depending on your target group. The target group may depend on the the, the, the site that you advertise on, but it's going to make the difference uh, if you uh, if there's a big match between your title. And the, the, the thing that the, 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 the consumer is looking for, you know, is Googling for, then Google is just way more likely to show your ad. And then, uh, and then if your ad is shown, the consumer is way more likely to click. You know, so the, the, the consumer says, uh, I want to buy a Levi's men's blue jeans uh, size, whatever, right? And then if the title contains that, Google will show it. And the consumer is going to say, hey, that's my brand. That's my size. That's my color. Let me click that one. Uh, so you get a higher CTR. And once he made it this far, he's more likely to buy. So tailoring that, 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 that title is really going to help you uh, with a triple whammy of more impressions, a higher CTR, and a higher conversion rate. I think uh, you know, it's one of the levers, one of the visible levers that works best to, uh, to perform well in, in, in feed marketing. And then, so when, when you have a clothing product like jeans and you have it in different sizes, um, so I forget what they're called, but you would basically have one product listing for each of the sizes rather than taking the one generic one and then making variations of that? Uh, yeah, it's called, uh, you know, we call it the parent product and, 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 and the variants. Uh, so if we stick to apparel, yeah, then the parent product could be the, uh, the, 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 the Levi's men's blue jeans and the size are the different variants. 
And then if you advertise on some channels like Google, it's very important that uh, every variant is an individual product. Whereas if you uh, advertise on Facebook, it makes more sense to just advertise the parent product uh, because you never know who the person on Facebook who's, who's looking at your ad what, what size he or she has. Where right, because the difference is that on Google, somebody searches and literally types in their size, whereas on Facebook, it's maybe showing up in the feed and it's more about, hey, this is a cool new style of jeans that you hadn't considered. By the way, nobody's wearing jeans anymore as far as I know. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, anyway, that, is the, that, that, that is the example. Uh, so you have, to, uh, you have to understand what to do on which channel. You know, we also we enable uh, every retailer to have uh, an individual product for every size, for every variant. Uh, we also uh, enable them to merge all those sizes into an individual uh, parent product that has exactly the attributes that you want it to have when it goes on Facebook or some other channel. And obviously, that it's you know, if you have like different prices for the different variants, that uh, the one you sent to Facebook shows the lowest price. So those are like small tweaks that will help you do a better job in those channels. So what's the most important thing that you've seen in terms of getting someone to click on a shopping ad, a product ad? Is it the price? Is it the image? Is it the title? It I'm going to have to say, I'm going to have to say image because this is like what 75% of the, of the space of any product ad, right? Uh, so on one hand, you know, obviously you need to get your images, right? But you know, it also already makes a big difference whether you are showing the image of a sweater or the image, you know, of a handsome guy like you, Fred, wearing that sweater. And, you know, where did you or me or, strike people from the sweater, so we shouldn't or somebody that. else in that sweater, 92% uh, of people are going to click the image that has the person in the sweater. The lifestyle images just perform much better than, uh, than images of just bare products. So, you know, th that's where you can get started. You know, it, it has got nothing to do with campaign optimization, not with data feed optimization. But boy, you know, check out your own shop and see, do I really like these images? Uh, are they high quality? Do I have like, you know, the blue image for the blue product? Or do I have a generic image? All the kind of stuff, you know. Uh, what's that's really the interesting what you're saying here because, I mean, Google is search and it's always like about relevance and like show the exact product. But you're kind of saying that, there's still like that lifestyle, the branding element that's super important and that gets you to stand out from everyone who's just focused so much on, okay, in this spreadsheet, which is the right product that shows exactly what that sweater is like. But you're saying like people like looking at other people's faces and they want to be happy. They want to have a good time. And, and if they can wear that sweater at that same time, like that's the thing that makes them click. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, it, it doesn't work that well for, you know, if you sell fridges. Uh, but yeah, in the case of the sweater, uh, it, it, it can make a difference. You know, there, there isn't one single uh, uh, solution that, that makes you sell everything. But the quality of the image and the opportunity for some kind of products to, uh, uh, to make a lifestyle image uh, is certainly uh, relevant. Mm -hmm. you know, and then title is next that I just spoke about. But uh, we, we're all visual, Fred. You know, we're people yeah. we're visually oriented. Yeah. Um, and then Elizabeth, I want to hear from you, but Jack, quickly answer this question from Joey about showing variants through Data Feed Watch. So Joey's asking um, whether Data Feed Watch allows variants to be shown as individual products and then triggered for searches that have that specific variant in the search. But, so he's basically saying on Google, like you were saying, Jack, somebody will type in the size of the product and then it makes sense to show that in the title. Um, so would Data Feed Watch automatically make individual listings for each of your different sizes? Uh, yeah, the short answer to Joe's question is yes, that's exactly what we do. Uh, you know, well, you know, probably it's already in your source feed, uh, the individual variants. You know, sometimes customers, they only send us parent products and then we like untangle them to make sure that you have all your variants. Um, and, and, and then you give it a go. Um, cool. The other thing I'd like to add here is that uh, sure, you can then add, for example, the site, you know, that is the variant uh, into your title. Uh, sometimes, sometimes you don't. Sometimes it's there, but it's not visible because it's like, you know, further to the end of the title. Uh, still, uh, you got to fill the size field as well. So even if it's not in the title, Google can see, ah, this is a size 38. 
So this is what the guy is looking for. Right. And so then the question also becomes, how do you structure your title, right? Given that there's usually so much you want to put in, but only part of it will show up. Um, there's, there, there's a whole science here. So, okay. you know, the, uh, it, it, it starts by saying, uh, gee, what would a customer uh, 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 be searching for? You know, if you make it up, it's not that difficult. Then again, you know, if you, if you uh, read a couple of articles, you know, like on a blog, you'll see that there's, there's best practices for uh for different uh categories of products um so the, the 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 thing that gets even gets even further is that you stop guessing what a customer would be looking for uh you start uh, basically checking out your search query report uh to see so you know we have we have this example you now this this the zoot gear one of the customers they're selling like sports apparel and they're selling like uh, you know baseball gloves, and it was like you know the the, the brand and the baseball glove and, and uh, a few other things, and they were doing well. But then uh, somebody uh, dove into their search query report and found out that uh, people that buy baseball gloves they actually enter in their search query whether they're left-handed or right-handed, you know whether it would be leather or uh, or some other kind of material, and whether it would be for them or for their kid. You know, and, and this shop never realized that. And then they started modifying the title to contain the material and left or right-handed and what have you. And, uh, you know, that completely takes the guesswork out of what a title should look like. You know, you're just fulfilling the, the desire of the customer. You know what it is. And, uh, you know, then subsequently we have people saying, well, hey, I got like 50,000 products. I'm not going to do that 50,000 times. No, no, of course not. But you can start. You can start by looking at product level for, let's say, the 20, 25 mm -hmm. products that are your best sellers that do like, you know, a few dozen percent of your total revenue. Or you just start by taking uh, your most important product categories so that uh, you're able to enhance those the, the titles of all those products in this category and instantly, uh, you know, make a lot of, you know, get a lot of additional traffic because that, that is basically what, what it is uh, about. Yeah, right. So use the search terms report to figure out how people structure their searches and then mimic that in the titles and then use a feed management system, some rules-based system to apply that at scale across exactly. many, many products. Exactly. And uh, if you guys, you know, uh, at home in your office, if you have 50,000 products and you're afraid to get started, you know, don't be because the, the, the key is in the starting. You know, no one's going to ask you to finish this before Christmas. But if you just get started with a couple of things that matter, you will already see the difference. And then if you if you continue doing that for the next couple of weeks or months, you know, in the course of next year, and uh, you know, you'll probably be able to cover thirty percent, fifty percent of all of your products by by making smart rules. And exactly. You know, Especially if you can cover fifty percent of your revenue, even if it's only ten percent of your products, like that's the the thing. Right? Exactly. Exactly. That's how you're being smart about it. Hey Elizabeth, what uh, what have you seen in terms of attribute optimization or feed optimization that uh, that works well? So it's the classic paid search answer of it depends, right? So if you're D2C and you are the only one that sells those fifty thousand products, then you know you control your universe. In which case, then it's it's a matter of of the t I I think title is is a big one, obviously from a search perspective. So it'll it'll pop in. But if you are not the only person that sells that particular item, then I lean more into what Jack is saying about image, because now you're competing with others in a visual search, essentially, right? So what are the images that you're showing, whether or not that's lifestyle or whatever, and who are your competitors in that space? So one of the things with retail media in the recent past that's come up is that some of the retailers like Target and Home Depot sell space in their Google shopping feeds. So you are a brand that is in Home Depot and maybe you're, you're, you're on the site, you're not in store, let's say, maybe you're a dropship um, a brand or something like that, or you have a very small in-store presence and um, you are not one of their, their biggest brands. So they're not putting you in their feed, you know, uh, on, their own, on their own free will. You can pay to play. So I can pay to be in Home Depot's Google Shopping feed for my cordless drill, of which there are 30 other varieties, but I can use that to boost it. If I do that, and I also have a DDC site, well, I don't want to use the exact same picture necessarily, right? Because now on the Home Depot feed, I've got 
I've got the brand of Home Depot behind me. I want some differentiation. And then the question is, should I be selling with, am I selling against myself, honestly, to be in Home Depot and, and the DDC, or should I have a, a change in the assortment? So my answer on the variant always depends on um, who else is selling it. And how does a company like Home Depot then allocate that space in the feed? Would they say we have space for one drill, two drills? Is it an auction? You pay. It, you pay. So it's part of a flight usually. So Target, both Target and Home Depot do this, and there's a couple others. So it's based on usually like a monthly kind of thing. You can book it like a month at a time. Um, it's that dollar amount. You don't control anything after that, um, but you do list out what the products are. There are, uh, they give you an estimate thanks to Google's ability to estimate out how, how, um, how many impressions and how much spend is needed for whatever length of time. And then you, you just do it and wait. And at the end you get a wrap report um, that tells you how many impressions and clicks and spend and uh, attributed sales, both online or in-store. And so is this only available to vendors that already have a relationship with Home Depot, with Target, where they sell those yeah. products and then they'll come so to So you, you either have to be in the store or online in some way because the transaction must take place on Target.com or Home Depot.com, right? So in the Google feed, the URL will, the, the product listing ad will direct to that retailer's product listing page. For right. So but are there two things here? One where you can say, hey, I... Um, I so I can go onto Amazon and basically list my product in their marketplace. I can do the same thing on Target. But that doesn't mean my product is physically available in a Target store, right? So, so that's Correct. one option. Um, so that if I go to Target.com, I'll find that product, which I'm then shipping. Um, but then Target also has its own feed that they give to Google. Yep. And that's got the Target brand behind it for online searches. So these are two different things, it sounds like. Correct. So you can do it. I can be a Target Plus Marketplace seller and have my product only bought on Target.com, but then I can work with Target Roundel and say, hey, my product isn't currently being included in your Google shopping efforts. I'd like it to be. Here's some money. And then that they do it for you. Yeah, that's great. It's it's like it's like almost a perfect equivalent of you know what used to be common practice in any physical store like 20, 30 years ago. That uh, you'd be a manufacturer, you go to to Target or whatever. Hey, you know, I want you guys to sell my products. You know, and you make a deal on how much margin price and whatever you. Uh, and then the, the the Target guy goes goes back to you and says, "Hey, would you like to do some in-store advertising?" Because basically, you know, and it's funny more. is this is something I'm working on for the next two years. Is that's the way it should work, but the way it works today is the the merchant or the buyer does not sit within the media team. So the all these retailers that have these different media teams, so Roundel, Walmart Connect, uh, Lowe's just launched their One Roof, Home Depot's Retail Media Plus, uh, Walgreens WAG, Walgreens Advertising Group, Ulta has one. They all have these sub-agencies within that handle just the media, but they talk to or sit next to the buyers, but they are not integrated. So that is that is where I see in the next two years for retail media where we have to get. Because if I spend four hundred thousand dollars promoting a product, you know, on this retailer's website, online, offsite, social, whatever, and then the buyer comes back and goes, "Well, thanks, that was cool, but sales were, you know, whatever." Like, there's a, there's a disconnect there. Yeah, basically, Elizabeth, you know, I think that there's, there's a clear link with what I said in the beginning that you know, you have like Google, Facebook, Amazon, and then any retailer who wants to sell his stuff will, will, will go there, but then also end up going to MOC or to Bix or to, you know, uh, kidsclothing.com or whatever. Uh, but they should also consider that there's another type of channel out there, which is retail media, media where, you know, again, there's an audience uh, that they can cater to, that they can advertise to. And yeah. uh, I guess that's, that, that's how your retail media story, uh, story fits into the total, right? Yeah. And, and then, and then there's that, there's that piece. And then there's the, all right. So again, that brand is D to C, maybe they also have a D to C site. So, you know, what, what are, what are the products that they're sending there? Are there exclusives? Is the information, you know, accurate? So when we think about like the, the Google, like the knowledge panel and like the product information that populates in there, where is it coming from? Are you claimed in manufacturer center? Can Home Depot, you know, information override yours? Absolutely. That's why you should do your man Google Manufacturer Center if you are the brand. Um, all that kind of stuff comes into play. But the larger the org at the brand, the easier it is to say than it is to do. And and the, the other thing that, that, that gets added here, I guess, you know, I'm asking you, Elizabeth, is that... Uh, 
you know, goes back to, so what, what are the attributes that are relevant for selling your stuff? Well, it's price, you know, you have the image, you have the title, you have the price. Uh, but, you know, I guess there's no reason for me that uh, to sell to sell my products uh, at, you know, for the same price via Google or in here's my another Here's another and fun in- fun thing I learned about the product content. So you've got the, the, there's the feed that you will work so hard and do so nicely and, and you know, online will look great. But then if you're, if you're a brand on the retailer back end, the question is, has the retailer upgraded their systems enough to speak to that? Because you have some pretty legacy retailers out there that have some product catalogs and some relationships with brands that predate the internet. I mean, we're talking like 50 years, right? There's, there are brands that have been in the Walmart stores for 50 years. Yeah. Um, I am pretty sure I've seen a couple of the catalogs. Um, that those were originally off a dot matrix printer somewhere in the nineties. Like there, there's some definite legacy information that has persisted in the system. So what I would say is um, new brands or digitally native brands have a advantage here for uh, clean product data. And so if that's you, um, you know, definitely do that investment and, and keep it up because it might proliferate for 50 years. <laughs> hey, I want to get to a question uh, that was asked here by Paul. Um, and it was about like in the attribute, if you have a, a lesser known brand, would you lead with the brand? Um, and I'm going to say no, but I want to hear from you, Jacques. But I also think it speaks to the broader question, right? So if you have a brand that's not as well known, but you now have the capability to piggyback on a bigger brand like Home Depot, like Target, like what's the advice on that? Um, and have you seen brands? And this is very common on Amazon, right? I mean, there's like all these crazy sounding brands nowadays, and they often make it sound like a brand you actually know. So you're like, wait, is that is that the one that's actually good? Um, but like, what strategies have you seen for starting out with a brand that's not known and building it into something like uh, like an Anchor or an Aki, which are now big brands on Amazon? Yeah, well, you know, if you're piggybacking uh, on a known brand, that, that's a different story, of course. But uh, yeah, if you if you sell stuff with an unknown brand. Uh, you have to realize that the, the the first part of your title is actually going to be visible on the page. So that is the most relevant and expensive piece of real estate in that product listing ad, you know, in, in the product ad. And uh, so if you put your brand there that no one's heard of, you're sort of wasting that piece of real estate. So then put it in the back. And then maybe you're better off uh, putting your product type first. Because after all, people may be looking for a brand. People may just be looking for a product and they'll still be triggered by the fact that, you know, the image shows the kind of product that they want. The title shows the product that they're looking for. That just have, doesn't have to be a brand. Or the brand's at the end. If they click it, they'll, they'll, they'll find it out. Uh, but I'd say Paul's got it spot on. Uh, if you have a branded product uh, and it's an unknown brand, put it at the end, you know, outside of you, but still in the title. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you're selling uh, Adidas sneakers, you know, by all means, put it in the beginning. Have either of you seen any studies to what degree uh, lesser known brands have started taking away uh, space or volume from better known brands because of the ease of, you know, selling stuff online and all of these marketplaces? Yeah, absolutely. And mostly it has come down to inventory, right? So if the well better known brand or bigger distributor or whatever is out, um, well, it goes, it goes to the next. So mm-hmm. we call it losing the buy box. And I have seen many a mega brand lose the buy box. Um, and it could just be from a distribution capability. Like they just didn't have the inventory. Uh, sometimes it's the brand, you know, it's really hard for a brand to be in 45 places well. So there are some places that, and for every single product. And so there may be some products that slide, slide down and a third party jumps in there and it is, it absolutely happens. Let's talk about that a little bit more in the context of the supply chain and all of the issues we're seeing right now and sort of the uncertainty around Black Friday. So uh, so I read a blog post yesterday that's basically saying, listen, you might have run a promotion for all of uh, Cyber Week, but now your product might actually run out after three days. Um, so how much discounting are you going to do? Like how do feeds play into um, making sure Google doesn't show your ad and, and run up a bill for you when you can't sell that product? Um, how do you sort of backfill? How do you put in related products? Uh, I, I know there's a lot there, but like starting thoughts on, on this, Elizabeth? Yeah, well, you know, the uh, 
the, the, the field that's very important here, and it, it, you know, it may sound too obvious and too corny, but you know, Google and many other fields have an availability field. You know, or other, other channels have a quantity field. You just, you just need to make so incredibly sure that that is always spot on because you don't want to sell stuff that you don't have. Uh, so you know, first worry about that. Is your availability field always uh, up to standards? Is it always correct? And then make sure that uh, your feed gets updated. You know, your feed gets updated by your shop, but also that the channel that you're advertising on gets gets an updated feed, you know, at least once a day. And if you have high turnover, make sure you do twice a day, you know, 20 times a day, every hour, doesn't matter. Uh, but that's going to make a, a huge difference. How quickly uh, does Google pick up your changes uh, based on experience? You said it's not really, not really that relevant, but a couple times a day. So is that to do with how frequently Google picks it up? or? Well, first of all, Google is not going to pick anything uh, up more than twice a day. Uh, you know, if, you're, if the GMC uh, fetches your feed, you know, which is still the case for most of the merchants, you know, Google will do that once a day for the full feed and then an update feed with availability and price you know, a second time. Larger advertisers... Uh, often have an FTP connection, and they then they can update as often as they want. Uh, I think same goes for if you have the uh, the GMC uh, API connection. Uh, so if you have a high turnover and you do need to refresh your feed several times per day, uh, I would advise you to get an FTP connection. And uh, you know, for example, we're a tool like Datafeed Watch. Uh, we can download your feed x times per day, you know, up to every hour, uh, then generate an updated uh, Google feed, you know, if we go with Google as an example, uh, you know, every hour, and then FTP is straight into your merchant center right away. So it can be fully automated. It doesn't, you know, most customers don't need every hour, uh, but it is something. Do you think that's changing now with Black Friday and sort of the velocity of sales that we might see? Um, so it, it is now maybe a good time to put this in place for advertisers that have historically not needed it? Or you think it's going to be fine? Uh, I, I think everyone should always consider this, and uh, and we do have clients that actually increase uh, the number of uh, let's say feed refreshes on a daily basis uh, during the Black Friday period, you know, and then they they bring it down to a lower frequency uh, in, in in the new year. Mm -hmm. You really I've need seen, to consider depending on the marketplace. I've seen um, the inventory feed updates go as fast as five minutes, which is about as fast yeah. as most of them will accept it. So you don't, it's, it, I mean, and it depends exactly on what you, how many, how much inventory you have of what and how many places you've listed it. So one of the things when I used to work in my previous role at Commerce Hub that we had, you know, that was, that was what we did on the, on the feed side was inventory management was so key and you had to have buffer stock for each one of these channels. So if you are listing that same item on four different marketplaces, it is absolutely crucial that anywhere that no less than I mean, 15 minutes is about as long as you want to go during those high periods um, before getting an inventory pushed um, update. Because if you sell out and the item goes out of stock and you have to cancel the order, then that goes against your seller score. And so you can only handle so many dings in that, that period before then they begin to suppress your listings in organic search. And then that becomes a very expensive problem in advertising later and or just business. So we had one client that had one big gigantic bucket of inventory. They called e-commerce inventory. And there was probably about six different retailers, including eBay, that was decrementing from that bucket. And so that's why it was so key that we were able to do it fast enough. Um, and then there's some, there's some, and then we had to have safety stock, right? So you have inventory buffers on a per um product even to a variant level because some sizes are more uh, popular than others right so let's say size eight shoes in women's is like the most i think it's the most common size so you have a higher buffer for that versus say like size five where you can take a little bit more risk there's there's another thing you can do fred when it comes to you know if you worry about your inventory so let's say you're gearing up now for the uh uh for for black friday <clears throat> And, uh, and so the, let's say the second container didn't arrive, right? Or still like floating out there in LA. Uh, but anyway, you know that uh, you're going to be limited on stock on a number of items that uh, maybe you're going to put on sale. Uh, so actually, you know, you think like, you know, I have like this product, I have like 100 items. 
And if you put it on sale, I could probably sell it like 200 times. Uh, but now I'm not sure. You know, what are you going to do? You could even you could even do stuff like, you know, again, if, if we take Google as an example. Uh, so let's say you create a custom label to, uh, to bid more. Uh, on an item that uh, uh, that you you know you think you're gonna sell easily, uh, then you could make that dependent on your inventory. So the custom label could be like you know uh, bid ten percent more or something. What, uh, one thing the, I'll note: if, oh, sorry, go ahead. Is, if the quantity is still like you know over fifty, but it gets below that, you know you withdraw the custom label. Basically, uh, you're lowering your bid. Right. Elizabeth, what uh, uh, to your point about inventory and, and whatnot, as we get into December, so like bidding strategies. So one thing that I've been looking at in the last couple of years is so Tenuti does a benchmark report um, every quarter. And obviously the Q4 benchmark report is always neat because one of the one of the graphs that I like to look at is where spend starts to drop. So um, Andy Taylor, who's our VP of research, he puts together these reports and puts them on every quarter. And we have nerd nerd discussions about like what he it means. He's on the show one time. I'm still like trying. He's to awesome. Him. You should have him back. Yeah, no, I did. He, he, he doesn't always like. He doesn't raise his hand. You have to go find him. Um, but uh, and then Mark Ballard now does the Google report um, for us as well. So anyway, should have those two guys. Um, but one of the things that I've started to overlay is when Amazon advertising spend drops off in December and when Google shopping spend drops off in December. And obviously, as you start to hit that free shipping window, that's when you start to see the Amazon advertising drop off a little bit in spend because we can no longer hit that two-day guarantee, right? So there is no longer that it's going to be there by December 24th. And of course, this year with inventory constraints and shipping backlogs and all of that kind of fun stuff, I have, uh, I'm curious to see if the Google shopping spend will shift as well. So usually it doesn't go, it goes down, but it doesn't go as far down as Amazon. Um, and a lot of that has to do with, and this is where I would say for anyone um, with in-store presence or ability to fill quickly or locally, um, those three days leading up to the 24th, as, as the online, in a sense, fails because they can no longer get it to you fast enough, is there opportunity to up bids in places like in with Google local inventory, right? And so you're gonna see the retailers really pick up at this um, as well, because if they have their own Google shopping, local inventory feeds, um, you're gonna see the local fulfillment coming through from like Instacart, from Shipt. Uh, remember Instacart can can bring it to you from I think it's 400 different retailers, from Best Buy to to, to groceries, to, to Ulta Beauty, like you name it, they can bring the thing to a GoPuff where you're sitting there on Christmas Eve and you realize that you've forgotten so-and-so and, -so and you know what, they just need a six pack of something. And so you can have that brought to you in 20 minutes. And they, of course, all have advertising options. So that's why I would start to look at if you have any kind of right. local capability that week, that could really be your week to shine. Well, and this is like one of these big questions for me too. Like how much are we going to be discounting for Black Friday versus what you're talking about, which is like the fact that it can be delivered very quickly. Um, and when it's the, the other thing that's nice about local delivery is like even if GoPuff or Instacart fails, like they still told me, oh well, it's coming from the Safeway, which is a mile away. So worst you case, could just scenario, go get it. <laughs> if my bike, I'll go get it, right? Um, whereas with Amazon, it's like, okay, well the truck's not there. Like I'm standing on the street waiting because like we're about to open the present, and it's still not there. But they say they're ten stops away. You can't go to that truck. Um, and so I'm just really curious, like in terms of messaging, like what's the value prop? for consumers because it's always been about free shipping um and price has been a big deal but like is that gonna be the same this year or is it gonna change i mean i think it's gonna be the same because here's the thing amazon they're a beast and they they know this is coming like they've been knowing it's coming forever i mean home depot costco and i want to say it was walmart was the other one rented their own container ships yeah Target like, Walmart, right yeah and so it's like okay well if they're doing that what and amazon has their own airplanes like there there's i don't think it's going to be that much of a crunch it's not going to be i get that I, I get a question asked a lot um on the um uh, news circuit which is kind of like you know is retail media going to take amazon dollars and the answer is no i'm sorry it's not it, it just isn't amazon is just too good right now as it is retail media is too young where the the value prop is is don't forget about stores 
Like there's still, there's still product physically sitting on a shelf somewhere. I mean, it was it that Schwarzenegger movie jingle all the way where he get like, he drives around town like crazy trying to find that toy. We can relive that eighties moment if we'd really like to, but there is <laughs> physical product sitting on shelves that is attainable. You, you can go get it. It's okay. And it helps um, if you're big and buff like Schwarzenegger. You can like, yeah. Punch and you can out. punch people out as you're, as you're going through the store. But um, you know, I don't think Amazon's going to, I mean, they're still going to have a really great year and we're still going to be able to get probably 90% of whatever it is um, or an equivalent. Right. So the, again, that, that point about the brand, right. Uh, as, as we get closer to the wire, no one cares what the brand is. They care. Does, is it, is it a radio car that the three-year-old wanted that they can throw against the wall? They don't, they don't care where it was made or what the yeah, brand I mean, was. The Amazons, the Costco's, the Walmarts, they're going to be fine. The Amazons. But what about uh, those people who, during the pandemic, well, we set up a Shopify shop? Yeah. Um, I hope they're Plan fine. ahead. Plan a lot ahead. I, I, I mean, I, I that's the local pickup it. angle, too, or delivery, right? So if yeah. you are able, so there's some, um, for example, like food-based, right? So if, like, you make cupcakes or macarons or yeah, baked goods or whatever, uh, there's a few folks that I've seen do, like, they sell it through the Etsy shop or their Shopify store. And they're like, if you're in this general area, I will just drop it off on your front porch. You know, it's like a 20 mile radius. Yeah. I, I agree that the value prop doesn't really have to change because of the, you know, the shortage, if you will. Uh, what, what I do suspect, you know, trust me, I don't have any evidence for that yet, but uh, I do suspect that, that a lot of consumers will be sort of alarmed by, you know, the fact that uh, some goodies won't make it on time. And they may be inclined to start their shopping earlier to be ahead of the game and make sure that they get the goodies uh, 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 before it's sold out. And, uh, you know, if, if that is a scenario that may unfold, then every retailer, especially the smaller ones, uh, should make sure that they are ready on time. You know, they're not still struggling with stuff uh, the day before Black Friday. You know, they should be up and running like, one or two weeks before, at least, to be in the game on time. And that may actually make the difference. And that may be one of the ways where a smaller retailer, you know, that's not called Amazon or Target, uh, may still be uh, able to sell out before Christmas. And then be ready for monster returns. And when you do value and conversion reporting to Google, figure out a way to report those returns. Because, hey, I find myself buying everything I can right now. And I'm like, I just, I just want to have choice when I actually want to make the decision. And there's such generous return policies right now. Yeah. Um, That's a real problem, actually, like for, for our industry in general, right? Because it's a, it's a huge cost suck eventually that we can only sustain for so long. So um, eBay has partnered with Optoro and Block and so they've, st and Target. And one of the things they've started to do is it's kind of like, you know, when you would go to the storage wars where you bid on the storage, like the storage unit, and then you're like, you open it and you're like, boy, I sure hope there's some good stuff in here I can do something with. Um, it's kind of like that. It's so it's Target's returns packaged in a big pallet and they pay, they bid and they, they buy the pallet, the eBay seller. So these are established eBay sellers that buy the pallet of returned goods, essentially. Um, usually it's at least organized in some sort of category. It's not like I'll just throw it in there and it's just like a total mess. Um, and then those established eBay sellers take those items and relist. Do they even open the packages when you return them or is it just like, oh, here's the box. We hope that there's a bunch of DVDs in there. I, my understanding is it's in, it's in saleable condition, but it's not, but the, the retailer does not have the infrastructure or the time or the people to like repurpose these items. Right. And it's just so wasteful. Yeah. Um, and it's a complete monetary loss. Yeah. Well, at least it's better than, like, I always wonder, right? When you send stuff back, does it just get burnt at the dump? Um, but you hear stories like that, right? Sometimes yeah, it's cheaper that's, to do that. Happens. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's awful. It's actually. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, hey, there's one other topic we should touch before I let you, uh, like, give your uh, final um, topics. But uh, turning your structured data, so turning your feed data, into something more than just product ads, right? We've talked about product ads, which have images and price points, but can you use this data as well to build out um, keywords, ads? And if so, like, uh, is that something you want to do, you recommend? Absolutely. I think one of the statistics I want read is that uh, if you, as an as a e-commerce retailer, 
you have a Google Shopping ad, and then you have a Google Text ads on the same page. You know, you're dominating, and uh, and visitors to that page are ninety. That's nine zero ninety percent more likely uh, to click their way to your store. Uh, so there is certainly something that is uh, that that is interesting. Uh, what I see a lot is that uh, you know in the old days everyone was doing text ads, and now slowly everybody that has moved moved into Google Shopping and moved out of text ads because after all, hey, it's way more cumbersome. Uh, so what we advise our customers is to basically return to text ads, but in an automated fashion. So we offer feed-driven text ads uh, where you create a data feed specifically for a text ad campaign. And then this campaign is generated automatically. You know, you, you take an hour, maybe two, to, to tweak everything. And you're using, uh, using the, the, the attributes from your feed uh, using the title basically to create uh, uh, long and short tail keywords and using the fields that you use in your, in your feed to create those text ads. Uh, so, I mean, the actual ads, you know, now our system is simple. You, you just drag your title into headline one and then you type, you know, for only, and then you drag the price field in and it says for only $19. Uh, and, and the beauty of it is that not only does it, uh, you know, it's low maintenance. It's, it's, it doesn't take you that much time to create it. It's updated automatically. And you can make sure there's never out of stock products in that feed. And therefore, you know, you'll finally stop advertising uh, out of stock products with, with, uh, with text ads. But the, the, the most beautiful thing about automation is that uh, you can actually create a unique ad with a set of unique keywords for every single product something that you'll just never end up doing when you do it manually, you know, go back to the guy that had 50,000 products, no way he's going to do that. Yeah. Uh, but now, you know, where he's like 500 or 50,000, he, he can set it up in a matter of hours and have a complete campaign with unique ad groups, text ads and keywords for every yeah. product. That's all. Awesome. So you can use data feed watch to do that. Uh, Optimizer has a solution that does that as well. It's called campaign automator. Yeah. We've got some case studies published on the site. So, um, you know, all very good points, Jack, obviously why you would do this, but in terms of CTR, we see dramatic lifts in CTR because your keywords are now that much more relevant to what the ad actually says. Exactly uh, but more importantly, the cost per acquisitions also come down, right? Because you get better quality scores. So Google charges you less for those clicks and then your landing page is actually the right one. So conversion rates just go up. Everything falls right. into place, basically. What? Everything falls into place. You know, it all comes together exactly. and it gets you like, you know, Fred, I had this case study that I used to do in presentations that, you know, here's this customer and that was using our feed-driven text ads. And I, you know, I stopped using that one. You know why? Because the, the percentage increase in conversion was so high that I, I was afraid that my audience would find it incredible. You know, and they call me out, you know, that's the Dutch guy, he's bullshitting, you know, it can be true. Yeah. You know? It was true. I just took something that was more moderate, but, you know, and obviously, you know, not every retailer is going to get like a 250% increase in conversion rate or whatever, uh, but some of them do. It's possible because, you know, it has the potential. Yeah, it depends where you came from, right? I mean, so if you had a, a good team like maybe one of us on the call managing it manually and then you shift to automation, yeah, you're still going to get benefit and you have to do far less work, which is nice. We're not going to get those same boosts. And that's fascinating too because I think a lot of people nowadays, they just do their feed, they set up a smart shopping campaign, which is like super minimal in terms of what they even think about. Um, and Google recommends it and we recommend it, but even with a smart shopping campaign, like have multiple campaigns with different targets, for example, based on the margin of your product. And you can use labels in the feed to like allocate things to the right campaign. And you can have those campaigns like reshuffle as your margins change, right? You can use tools to do that, this. Um, but yeah, I mean, so you go from people who are really hands off with smart shopping campaigns to all of a sudden getting into creating keywords. Um, so it is helpful to have a nice templated structure that forces them to do the right thing. Exactly. Yeah. No, I can, I can totally recommend it. It works. Have you seen anything like this, Elizabeth, or uh, what's your take generally on running as many channels as you want? And, and even like in terms of marketplaces, right? Like, well, I mean, marketplaces you, should you be on? this structured data, these campaigns, these new keywords, everything it's content, right? You can mm -hmm. reuse that content. 
on product detail pages. Heck, what, what if what if SEO matched um, what you were doing? Wouldn't that wouldn't that be something? Um, and then you can also use it obviously in the seven other places you are. Um, social can also be beneficial there. Some of the just like keywords, like what are the what are the things that people search for? Like what might cue them up on social? And maybe the same, maybe different. Uh, maybe people search for a, a, a problem, you know, and your product is the solution. Can you reuse those kinds of terms over in your social? And then a kind of piggybacking on that even further, your email campaigns and or if you have like a micro influencer uh, campaign or something, or you've got someone that's like pushing something for you or um, going to tag it, like wh how do they describe it? How do they describe it in a way where if someone were to read that post and like not act on it, but want to recall it later, um, what do you want associated with it? Yeah. Yeah, so thinking even beyond the paid channels, SEO, I love that. Well, good. Hey, we're uh, pretty close to the top of the hour. So uh, let me give you each a minute to talk about something that maybe we haven't touched on that's really important or just uh, tell people where to find you, how to get a hold of you. Uh, Elizabeth, why don't we start with you? Um, if people want to know more about Tenuity, where do they go? <laughs> Tenuity.com. Or you can, uh, we have so much content that I would highly recommend that if anyone wants to know any about uh, the benchmark reports that we have for Amazon, Facebook, um, and Google. But within each of those, also there are additional um, pieces. So for the Amazon one, we also now have Walmart Insights. And for social, for Facebook, we now also have Pinterest and Snapchat. So I would definitely recommend checking those out. And then it's free. It just costs you an email. And I promise we don't spam you or call you or do a bunch of weird stuff. Um, and then you can find me at HeroConf in January, hopefully, in Austin. Or uh, I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, and actually, in a couple of weeks on the 17th, I'm scheduled to be on the eMarketer podcast, uh, I mean, uh, webinar and podcast. So Nice. So, uh, yeah, follow you on Twitter, and then you'll post all of that there, I'm sure, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, Jacques, what about you? How do people find out more about DataFeedWatch? Uh, DataFeedWatch.com, easy enough. Uh, and like Elizabeth, I can recommend a blog where you find tons of stuff. Uh, uh, about how to optimize your data feed. Uh, you know, if you give me 30 more seconds, Fred, you know, I, I, I'd like to mention a couple of things that we didn't touch upon, but I think are crucial to mention yeah. in terms of data optimization. You know, no matter how fancy the custom labels are that we spoke about and managing on gross margin, you know, the most important thing is that the feed is your foundation. So first make sure that your feed is complete and accurate. Give as much data as you can to Google and make sure that it's all correct and that nothing is missing. That alone is going to make a big difference. The other thing that is a, is a differentiator uh, is uh, don't don't advertise all your products. You know, think about uh, what are my profitable products, and if products are less profitable, you know, let's just not advertise them. Let's exclude them from the feed. If half of my sizes of any shoe is sold out, let me stop advertising for it because it's got a lower conversion potential. And as you know, as an example, you can do that with a feed tool like Data Feed Watch. The thing that uh, I'd like to close off with is uh, there was this one item in every product ad we didn't touch upon, and it is price. Uh, and uh, you know it goes to the previous topic. What are you what what are you not going to advertise in order to maximize your campaign ROI? It is the products where your price sucks. So you know if you use PriceWatch, which is another service that we offer, uh, you can actually see who is uh, bidding for the exact same products that you are selling at what price. And then you know if your price is like fifteen percent lower than the nearest competitor then you know, either raise your price or, or, uh, or lower your bid because you can afford to. And if it's the other way around, just exclude those unprofit un unprofitable products from your feed, stop advertising them, and spend that buck on products that turn you the biggest profit. And with that, you'll have a super Black Friday and a very Merry Christmas. And lots of profits and not just a good ROAS because ROAS doesn't matter. <laughs> Good. Uh, well, this has been a great session. Uh, both of you, thank you for coming on and sharing all your wisdom. Thank you. uh, everyone, like Jacques, I mean, Jacques should have really wrapped it up here, but uh, super happy Black Friday. Um, I'm going to be going back to Europe. So uh, find me actually in Amsterdam at Friends of Search in two weeks from now. I'll also be at Friends of Search in Brussels. And I'll be at the UK Search Awards to present some of the awards in London on November 17th. 
November 16th. Brussels, November 17th. So I'm excited to go back to Europe. Hopefully I don't get quarantined, with, uh, even though I'm triple vaccinated with a positive test. Look forward to meeting a lot of people in person there. And then we'll be back with another PPC town hall in December. Elizabeth, Jacques, you've been great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Happy Q4, everyone.